interest of more or less being on time, let's go ahead and get started. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to our final Energy Summit panel here at RJI in the Missouri School of Journalism. I'm Mike McKean. I'm the director of the Futures Lab here at Reynolds and also a professor in uh, convergence journalism here. Our uh, first panel this morning focused on how the media cover energy issues, and for the next hour or so, we're going to talk uh, just with a little bit of a different approach. We're going to share some examples of students on the four University of Missouri campuses who are working with faculty and staff on innovative ways to save energy, manage energy, and adapt new forms of energy. And it's my hope that the uh, journalists and others in the room will find these stories compelling and worth sharing with others. I'd also like to call your attention to the fact that two of the six projects you're going to hear about uh, this morning actually receive financial backing from a new fund we have on campus called the Interdisciplinary Innovations Fund. This is money that is managed by the campus IT committee. It comes from the IT fee that all of the students pay. And as the name suggests, it supports student-focused projects that make innovative uses of IT by crossing traditional boundaries in the academy. Last year, the fund started with $100,000, and I'm happy to say that for the next school year, it's growing to $200,000. The deadline for applying is tomorrow, so if you don't have a project already in mind, it's probably a little bit late to get it in. Uh, but next Wednesday and Thursday, for anybody who would be interested, um, at uh, this room from uh, 3.30 to 5 o'clock, we're going to, or excuse me, from 3 to 5 o'clock, we're going to have pitch sessions, so to speak, where all the teams who are trying to compete for money from that fund will be sharing uh, what their project is all about. And uh, it's open to the public, anybody who'd like to attend. Um, today we have six students here representing their work and actually seven uh, additional colleague uh, on the uh, helping us with the uh, solar decathlon project and I'd just like to ask them to give about an eight to ten minute presentation on their work and that'll give us time for a few questions and comments at the end. So some introductions on my immediate left is uh, Ben Datema from Sustain Mizzou and he is the driving force behind the building dashboard project. Ben and his team have been running a student competition to reduce energy consumption in the dormitories by providing real-time web-based feedback. Next to Ben is Jared Carr from UMKC. Jared has designed a really unique environmentally friendly enclosure for a research scientist who is doing his summer research on an island in the Arabian Sea, and he'll tell you more about what that project's all about. Next to Jared is uh, Paul Bilger. Paul is working with students from MU and Missouri University of Science and Technology in the Solar Decathlon Project, where 20 teams from across the country, and I, is there an international team or two involved in this as well? They're designing, uh, building, and operating what they hope will be the most attractive, effective, and energy efficient solar-powered house that they can build. Next to Paul is Brian Glass. He's from uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology. Brian and his colleagues have created the Chameleon Automation System. And Chameleon is a smart system that can control everything from heating, cooling, lighting, your appliances in your home for both optimum comfort and energy consumption as well. And then uh, next to Brian, we have Will Lowe's from the University of Missouri St. Louis. Will is researching how to synthesize nanostructures for a variety of different energy applications. And I'm really looking forward to finding out how that works. And then uh, finally, uh, let me introduce Sarah Scully. Sarah is the president of the uh, Mizzou Hydrogen Car Team, and she's a copy editor at the Columbia Missourian. Sarah's going to share with us how her group is designing the car of the near future. And uh, we're going to start with Ben talking about building dashboard. Cool. Steal your mic from you. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Dema. Uh, as Mike McKean said, I'm former president of Sustain Mizzou um, and started this Mizzou dashboard thing uh, when I didn't have enough to do after that. Um, so I'll run you through the system that's up here behind me. Uh, this is the introduction screen. Uh, we have Hatch, College Avenue, and Schur's residence halls hooked up to the system. Um, what that means is that each of these halls has a data logger in place that monitors um, the amount of energy going into the building and being used at any given point in time. Uh, it provides real-time feedback so it's as close to real time as we can get uh, within a couple minutes or so. Um, and you'll probably see this update uh, while I'm talking here. So we can see that the hall currently is using this much. Uh, this little now bubble floats where it, uh, the column will be uh, at the conclusion of the hour if they keep using energy at this current rate. 
Um, and you can see the historical rates that they've used. And if we mouse over, we can see the number attached to that, the number of kilowatt hours they've consumed. Uh, we can see the total number of kilowatt hours they've consumed since midnight on the left side over here. Um, and the performance compared to a historical uh, baseline, uh, actually this time yesterday in this case. Um, along with that, we can see yesterday, right over the top here, uh, where the bubbles are red, it means they used more. They're just updated. So that's a 2% higher uh, at 6 a.m. today than it was yesterday at 6 a.m. Um, where it's green, we can see that they've used less. The mouse over it should say. There. 2% reduction there. Um, and then we can hide that too. So if we go down to comparison here, we can do a direct comparison between two halls. Um, so we'll pull up Schurz, which for some reason, Schurz and Hatch are the same uh, structures, essentially. It's kind of the same uh, building, but flipped around a little bit. Uh, but Schurz is always higher, and we're not sure why. We're trying to figure that out right now. Um, Schurz was not happy about that in the competition until we told them that it's OK because we're comparing them against themselves over history, and it, it, was, it was good after that. Uh, so we can see the direct comparison between the two. Um, and again, the Schurz bubble up here and the Hatch bubble right there, showing how much they're using now. Uh, we can also look at uh, historical data. So we can go to yesterday and pull that up real quick. Um, and then we can go to last week and last month also. And you can see the, uh, the time scales changing on the bottom here. So this is daily uh, over the course of the last week. We can look at last month also which is pretty interesting because you can see spring break uh, here, where Hatch is pretty uh, level the whole time. They were doing some work in Schurz, some maintenance work, so that's why Schurz is all over the place. Um, but it's, it's pretty interesting to see kind of the, the baseline uh, for the natural building just kind of keeping its systems running without people in it. Uh, in addition, we can go to unit equivalents. So you can convert this instantly into dollars. Uh, so we spent $7,858.42 um, for the energy needs of Hatch Hall today, just since midnight. Or wait, no, that was last month, sorry. Got to keep my, uh, my time scales here. We'll look at today instead. Okay, that's, that's much better. I was a little concerned. Uh, $106.74 for the energy needs of Hatch Hall since midnight. So we can see that instantly. And that's based on... Um, data that we provided to Lucid Design Group uh, when we set this whole thing up. Uh, so you can also go to the comparison tab here and see direct comparisons again um, with each hall and get some more specific information. Uh, the really cool thing is the competition tab, though, uh, where you can see the competition that ran from April 13th to April 18th, um, which means that it's done now. Over the course of the week, they saved 1,283 1, kilowatt hours. Uh, over the course of one week. Schurz uh, came out on top with a 3.4% reduction, again, compared to themselves over the previous two weeks. But they're currently 5.4% above baseline, which is, you know, it's a little rough. We'll have to get in there and, and tell them to conserve. Uh, and then College Ave was right behind them at 3%, and Hatch uh, pulling up behind uh, with 1.1% reduction. So the whole point of this system is to provide real-time feedback so people can attach numbers to their energy usage and see how much the building's using uh, at any given point in time. Uh, if they have a number, they can compare it directly to another time period. Uh, they can see the actual influence of their actions on the system um, and see, you know, it turns energy conservation into something more tangible um, so they know what they're doing. Uh, how am I doing on time? You still got about uh, three. Perfect. Um, I'll talk about the competition a little bit then. We used some uh, innovative marketing practices on this whole thing. Uh, I like to call it um, kind of a ninja marketing campaign. Uh, we wanted it to just blow up in the halls overnight. So suddenly, Mizzou Dashboard, you know, you're in a competition. All of a sudden, um, it just appears everywhere. Uh, so we had some Dashboard Ninjas, a ninja marketing crew, uh, going at 5 in the morning one day. Uh, which was a little bit painful for the volunteers. We're going to try to arrange coffee next time or something. Uh, it was a little rough for them um, until we got moving, and, and then it was pretty fun. Uh, so we, we had the Res Life marketing staff come in, uh, and they had cameras, and they were recording all this. We have a couple of videos um, of us running around and 
being idiots uh, in the halls, uh, hanging up these door decorations for all of these students. Um, again, the innovative marketing, uh, the you suck energy. Um, I heard from a few students that they were kind of offended by this at first. I uh, didn't know what was going on, but it definitely grabbed their attention, and then they realized what the deal was, and it made sense, um, which is you know, the point, uh, to grab their attention with everything. Uh, we also provided them with post-it notes. Um, you can see those on the door deck, too, uh, that say you suck energy on top. Um, and then it has some uh, little check boxes underneath that say unplug me, turn me off, stop wasting me, uh, or there's a blank line for another category if you'd like to insert something else on there. Um, so yeah, the competition lasted a week, like I said. Uh, we didn't get the results we expected or that we hoped for this time around. Uh, I aimed for a 15% reduction. Uh, when I told energy management that on campus, they said there's no way. That's super ambitious, um, and they turned out to be right. So we're going to try a different marketing scheme next time. Um, we didn't expect to get it right, you know, completely right the first time. Uh, so we're going to go back and try again. Uh, we had the system. It's in place. It's super cheap to operate from here on out. Uh, so we're going to keep using it, you know, semester by semester. Um, we can have competitions anytime. I just have to go in and uh, click on Create New here. It takes five minutes to set it up, so no problem there. Um, and we'll see what we can pull off in the future. All right, and uh, thanks, Ben. And while we're passing the laptop down, we'll let Jared fill up his uh, presentation or presentation here. Maybe you could say just 60 seconds about your participation in this uh, Interdisciplinary Innovations Fund and uh, what value, if any, that's had for your project. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the Interdisciplinary Innovations Fund is really important because it provides support to student-led projects. Uh, I don't think that I could have learned, well, clearly I couldn't have learned uh, many of the lessons that I got from this project without having that support and the opportunity to take on a, a large-scale project like this on my own. Uh, when I heard about a $25,000 grant opportunity, it sounded pretty intimidating. I wasn't really sure if I could handle it, um, but I was willing to dive in and see how it worked out. It worked out really well. Uh, so again, I think it's really important to have that support in place and those opportunities on campus um, for students like these to take advantage of. All right, uh, Jared, tell us about your research pavilion. Yeah, go ahead and grab that. Uh, research pavilion is a, a project, it's the final project for the environmental uh, design studio at UMKC. Uh, basically about 50 students each year do this same project. And uh, the idea is that you have a, a small research pavilion that is designed for a professor to use during the summer to get out of the, the university offices and be able to perform new creative research in a new environment. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, the, the advantages of having such a small program is that you have to deal with compactness. You have to make the design fit into a 10-foot cube. Um, that challenges how to get someone to be able to sleep and eat and work and do all the things that they would like to be able to do. Um, typically, we're told that they're going to be using it for four to six weeks at a time with you know, no other place to, to live. And so you know, the idea is to give them a comfortable place to actually be able to perform their, uh, their research. Uh, it has to be mobile. It's supposed to be stored in a, a warehouse when it's not in use. Uh, so that makes it, so that 10-foot cube idea has you know, to collapse and be able to be tucked away, um, which presents another unique challenge. And it has to be versatile. You've got to be able to open it up and not require a whole construction crew to set the thing up and, and use it. You know, should be able to you know, a couple people, once the forklift sets it in place, open it up and begin to use it. Uh, we've had a variety of clients. Uh, it's usually faculty at, at UMKC, architects, artists, authors. Uh, the client I have was a biogeographer, which was a new word to me. Uh, chemist, art collector, composer, environmental psychologist, geologist, philosopher, physicist, poet, urban planner. So we've had a, a wide variety of uses and uh, it makes each project fairly unique. Uh, my project was for Dr. Davies. She's a biogeographer, which means that she studies the relationship between life forms and land forms. Uh, she studies what plant life does to local uh, topography and how the, uh, that interaction is, particularly plant life and human life. 
her research, she decided she wanted to go to the island of Socotra, which is in the uh, Indian Ocean, and I had never heard of it before she mentioned that that's where she wanted to be placed. <laughs> uh, it's a very remote island. It's part of the Republic of Yemen, uh, and it is so isolated that there are more unique endemic plant species on that island than almost any other place in the world. Um, it, there are these dragon trees that you it just look like something off another planet. And so her research was going to be going there, collecting plant samples, doing research as to you know, the, the history of the plant life on the island. Uh, the biggest problem with this island is that she was going to be there during monsoon season, which when you're in India is wet and rainy and nasty, but when you're on the other side of the ocean, it's dry and windy and hot. And so basically wind storms and sand storms all the time. Because the island's remote, uh, the culture there is isolated from the rest of the globe. It's a very strict, traditional Islamic culture there. And she's got to be able to do her research. She has to do things with microscopes, plant presses. She was going to have to be able to, to blog and record, uh, be connected to the rest of the world. The uh, metaphor that I came up with as a solution to this problem was that of a, a folding chair. Um, I was looking at objects that are durable, that can be expanded and adapt to a variety of uses and can take a little bit of, of beating up. Uh, the picture there on the right is what uh, my project would look like in its closed position. Basically one end of it opens up and creates an outdoor workspace. Uh, it unfolds like an accordion. And then the roof components fold up. I looked at the mechanism of a folding chair and it's basically a, a quadrangle that's not square and it allows it to do some pretty amazing hinging movements that when you actually get to looking at it, something that seems really simple is a lot more complicated than it looks. So that shows the sequence of the, the roof sections opening up there. Uh, the roof offers uh, plenty of shade from that hot sun. Uh, the materials would be a, a, a polished aluminum so that it would be highly reflective. It uh, doesn't have a lot of thermal mass, so it doesn't pick up a lot of the heat from the sun. It, I mean, it would get hot, but it would dissipate pretty quickly because it wouldn't be storing a lot of heat. And the idea is that uh, it's all, the angle of the roof is almost directly the angle of the sun overhead so that solar panels can be installed on those surfaces and provide power for the unit. Uh, ventilation, because the, the roof is, is canted at that angle, it creates a, a venturi effect in the attic space that draws ventilation up through the floor. The floor would, would be basically an open, like a, a wood deck, and you could draw ventilation up through there. That way, instead of having a 40 mile an hour wind blowing across you, you have a, a gentle ventilation that's pulling up through the unit to refresh the air continually, and it's drawing cool air from below the unit rather than just the hot wind that's blowing by. Um, another if, if that wasn't enough to protect from the wind, uh, fabric barriers could be installed uh, below and for the, that outdoor space to also block the, the sandstorms. Uh, I had to divide the, the space up basically into a, a private space and a public space uh, because to meet both her professional needs and the cultural needs. Uh, in Islamic culture, it would not be acceptable for her to be airing out her laundry, you know, in public where someone could see it. It was necessary to provide a space that was uniquely hers, that was clean. Um, so it, on the on the left side there, you see the basically a bed that's raised up a little bit. There'd be clothing storage underneath, a clean desk where she could do work at the computer, um, and things you know that did not require being out in the, the dirt. On the other side, uh, on the outside, there's a, a work desk and a kitchenette area. So, and the, the nice thing about raising the pavilion up was that I could fit the kitchenette underneath the bed and have basically two, an interstitial space there that uh, allowed for a variety of use in a very compact environment there. Um, basically, the, the project challenges students to take a, a concept and look at making it as concise and clear as possible to meet real challenges. This wasn't just an energy project, it was energy and culture and use, and it was a, you know, a pretty
pretty big world to try to fit this small thing into and, and make it work. All right. Thanks, Jared. Let's uh, pass the <coughs> computer down to Paul, and while he's pulling up uh, the uh, solar decathlon information, uh, <clears throat> perhaps you could also introduce your colleague and, and uh, your, uh, your mentors over here from faculty and staff as well. And pull that microphone right close. Great. So tell us more about the Solar Decathlon Project. All right. I'm just going to repeat a little bit of what you said. The Solar Decathlon is an international competition for university students. Oh, my name is Introduce Anna, your name. Yes, way. please. <laughs> my name is Anna Fleischer. Um, and uh, it's put on by the Department of Energy. Every two years, 20 teams are selected to participate in designing, building, and operating the most attractive and energy efficient solar powered home. Um, after two years of designing and building this project, the teams from all over the world transport their house to Washington, D.C., where it sits on the National Mall for two weeks and is open to the public. There, hundreds of thousands of people have the chance to learn about the most innovative technologies, design techniques, and materials, and we have the lucky chance to be the teachers. Uh, the Show Me Solar team is a collaboration between Missouri University of Science and Technology and the University of Missouri Columbia. These universities both have a vital role in the success of the competition. Missouri S&T provides the engineering expertise, while the University of Missouri provides the design expertise. In the classroom, we are not exposed to these other disciplines that are so vital to the success of the program. Um, since we're in two locations across Missouri, communication has become a key proponent of the project. We rely heavily on technology and our monthly face-to-face -face meetings. Onto the concept and design for the Show Me Solar Home. From the beginning, our team decided that harvesting enough solar energy to power the house, which is all the competition requires, simply wasn't enough. To stand out in the competition, we designed an ADA compliant and LEED certified home. By designing an accessible and sustainable home, our team of 40 interior design, architecture, and engineering students alike have become more socially and environmentally conscious designers. Architecturally speaking, the design concept of the home relies on a modular three-foot grid on which everything connects, leaving the design crisp and elegant, simple for construction, um, unifying the interior and exterior spaces. The home's north-south axis is elongated, so the entire house will fit on a single truck for the transportation to Washington, D.C., saving the environment from unnecessary harmful emissions and saving our team thousands of dollars in transportation fees. With the elongated axis in mind, plus the educational aspect of the competition itself, our concept for the home became expanding horizons. The integrated technologies of the home systems, which Brian will talk about next, from the solar panels to the home automation, incorporate themselves into the daily life of the occupant, and they can become familiar with the value of solar technology. The house gains its structure from structurally insulated panels, known as SIPs. These panels are made of oriented strand board and a high-density foam. They are factory-made, eliminating waste, and provide for a fast installation. They increase energy savings by 50 to 70 percent and provide more comfort in the indoor environment. The house has also been designed for ease of transportation, like Anna said. Uh, we have incorporated a hinge system where the roof will fold down on the side walls by removing portions of the east, west, and north walls. These portions will then be stored in the house as we take it to DC. This reduces the labor time while on the mall so we can spend more time on uh, some of the other details. Some uh, green design techniques we used we're placing the living areas all on the south side and all of the storage and appliances on the north side of the, of the home, creating greater insulation where it's needed and keeping all the living spaces um, on the south where we can use passive heat from direct sunlight. The design also implements natural ventilation with windows running the length of the north and south walls and other special features include the ADA accessible kitchen and bathroom where um, 
special attention had to be paid. We don't have a floor plan in this, um, but you can kind of get an idea of the entire house with some of these renderings. Um, so active solar was the main focus of the competition. We have designed a photovoltaic array that fills the entire south facing roof. This is paired with an evacuated tube system that will provide all the heating necessary or the hot water demands. Um, uh, these systems are then complemented, complemented by a passive solar design. This includes the elongated east to west axis and a horizontal louver system. Um, this is designed to block the sun's summer rays and allow for the winter rays to penetrate deep into the space. These systems together combine the best of technology and nature into one package. And we've been time for questions. We'll take some questions uh, a little bit later at the end. Did you also have a website that shows uh, a webcam of the, the house? Yeah. Do you have a chance to pull that up real quickly? Yeah, we do have another couple of minutes. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's have a look. Right here. Oh, what? Sorry. Okay. This is um, our live feed of what's happening on the construction site as we speak. Let's hope so. It is, uh, <laughs> there's currently no work being <laughs> done, but uh, this shows how the, the SIPs have already been put up and that. that Thursdays is. are off day, check back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's, al there's also time lapses, so you can keep yourself entertained when there's nothing going on out there. Yeah, and it kind of shows that you can Watch these on your own. And when do you load it on the truck to haul it to Washington? In October, um, September, sorry, <laughs> September of 2009. It needs to be there in October. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, we'll come back and have some more questions in a bit. Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and pass the laptop uh, down to uh, Brian? And as it turns out, uh, the uh, Chameleon automation system, which he's going to show you here in a second, is being used as part of the Solar Decathlon project, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Although it has many other applications obviously but let's go ahead and have uh, Brian pull up his presentation and share a little bit more about what chameleon does all right um, hi I'm Brian glass um, as Paul and Anna mentioned uh, the chameleon automation system is one of the engineering subsystems that's being implemented into the 2009 Solar Decathlon House for the Show Me Solar House team. Um, it's kind of an interesting system that arose from uh, several different problems, and I'm going to put them in a special order. The first problem is what your team, what my team will tell you uh, this arose from, and that is that I am a computer engineer on a civil engineer's team. Um, so that, that was me on the construction site the first day, actually. <laughs> and that was one of the less horrified pictures. It got, it got worse as the day went on. Um, I, I learned what a chalk line was that day too, so educational experience. But um, realistically, one of the biggest problems, and I'm going to kind of universalize this outside of just our solar house project, is that you have a lot of research being done in energy collection. Their solar cells have come a long way, so have all the other technologies. Um, one, of, one of the disconnects and one of those areas that's missing is in the actual building end use efficiency. Um, if you can minimize the amount of energy that a building takes, uh, you don't need to generate as much either, and the energy that you generate can then go to other uses. So the, the chameleon system um, is going to aim, aim at that. There, there's also a prevalence of home automation systems. They're becoming more and more uh, prevalent because they can do a lot of different powerful things. There's a lot of convenience factor that's, that's become re becoming realistic instead of just a novelty. So our, our solution to this energy problem is a hybrid system. It's that automation system, but it's going to save you energy too. Um, in our, one of our previous solar houses, we used um, an out-of-box automation system. It was great for convenience. We had, we had audio systems. We could control our windows, but there was a huge overhead. We had closets just filled with uh, different electrical components, and, and it drew quite a bit of power. So what we can do is we can use that same overhead um, and, and the same interfacing systems and the same motors and sensors and we can pr provide that convenience, but we can do it in a more energy efficient way. And that's, that's the concept behind Chameleon. And, and we'll get into how it does that shortly. 
Uh, yeah, so, so the, the basic way of doing this is optimized control logic. You're not going to see a very large increase in the hardware that there is in the amount of sensing power required. Um, it's just a novel way of controlling everything that's actually there. Um, and and this, is, this is where they ended up moving me. This is the back of my lab, and it might look like an electrocution hazard to some of you, but much more comfortable here than I was in the last picture. <laughs> so um, the objectives of the project, and there's, there's a couple here. Um, the first is obviously the energy saving. We can't call this an active energy management system if you're still losing energy. So the, the subsystems in the house, and there's a lot of them, and they've been broken down into different categories. This one's really the most important to us for, for competition and from the energy standpoint. So saving energy, and these are the different subsystems that we've implemented. There's heating, ventilation, and cooling. Um, what, what you'll see in our solar houses, as well as a lot of other modern houses, is that your heating and cooling units are separate. Um, what we use is it's a hydronic radiant floor, and all that means is we pump hot water underneath the floor, and it slowly radiates up. We do that because we can make our own um, hot water straight from the sun in addition to electricity, and because it, it uses less energy even if we couldn't. Um, since that energy is coming up from the floor, you're comfortable at a much lower temperature. It's not all of the heat above you. So since we're using separate systems, and, and they're very high-level complex systems, there's not really a, a way out there currently to integrate them. So the first thing our system is going to do is pull those together. So you can get into a race condition where, where your heating and your cooling are deadlocked. Um, and they're, they're both running. And you're just spending energy and your temperature's not doing what you want either. So that's a problem from an energy standpoint as well as a convenience standpoint. So by integrating those, we can make sure that only one runs at a time by having a centralized thermostat control. Um, some of our other houses, and a lot of the houses you'll see, may have upwards of four or five thermostats because of the different number of systems. Um, additionally, we have controls on our windows, and what that allows us to do is, with sensors inside and outside, if the outside temperature and humidity is more optimal than what's inside, the system may determine that it's going to open the windows instead of turning your air conditioning on. Um, you know, if it's 68 outside and 78 inside and you want it colder, it's going to be more energy efficient every time to open those windows. So if you allow the system, you get to set a preference because not all people like that. But if you allow the system, it's going to open those windows for you, drastically reduce the amount of energy, because HVAC is a very, very large load in your house. Similarly, we're going to control the lighting. Um, there's the conventional lighting control that you guys have, that would expect and what you've probably seen all over the place, which is if nobody's home, it turns it off. We have occupancy sensors in the house. And if nobody's home and there's a light left on, we will terminate it. The other thing we can do is a, is a little more novel. And what that is is we, we have shade controls as well. So if you want a certain light level in the house and you don't care how you get there, you can tell it that that's the light level you want, and it might open up your shades if the light outside is at a better level. Um, or it might close those shades to maintain that level for you, too. So you also get that added convenience. Um, lighting is obviously a very large load in the house. Um, even if you're using LEDs or compact fluorescents, it still adds up pretty quickly. So by minimizing that at all, you're saving quite a bit of energy. There we go. Appliances. Um, this is one of our cooler projects, and this is actually um, a joint development effort that we've had with a couple of global companies, um, and, and not something you'd really expect. The appliances use hot water. Obviously, your washer, your dryer, your dishwasher. Well, not your dryer, some of them. Um, but, but it still pulls a lot of power. So what, what we can do is you can set those to run ahead of time. I don't know about you guys. I try to be clean, so as, I'm, as, as I go throughout the day, if I use a dish, I toss it, toss it in the dishwasher. What you can do is you can cue your dishwasher. Okay, you go over to one of the touch screens that's in our house and you press this cue button. It just means that your stuff's in there. What's going to happen is we have sensors that detect the level of solar radiance, which is just how strong the sun is on the house. And once it hits a certain level, it's going to start those appliances up for you. And what that allows us to do, because we have this solar collection, is we run it at a time where we're going to be able to recollect all of that hot water. So we're not using supplemental water heaters that take an incredible amount of energy. Even if you're not doing these, the, this hot water collection method, you can run it during off-peak grid hours so that um, you don't get peak demand charges, which are becoming very common. Um, and, and there's all kinds of benefits to that as well. So, and our last one is standby power termination. All those little devices in your house that draw power when they're off. Uh, we actually, based off of occupancy and everything and which outlets have what devices, we can actually uh, simulate a physical disconnect between that. So that draw goes to absolutely zero, which is nice and adds up pretty quickly as well. Oh, there we go. Okay. 
Um, in addition, as Paul and Anna mentioned, one of the other things that we are, are very concerned with is education. Um, so one of the big things is educating the user, the, the resident, as well as the people that um, are, we're going to tour through the house. Um, I, I actually live in one of our solar houses, and I, I've become much more energy conscious because of some of the measures we've taken to do this in the past. Um, throughout the house, we have information displays. We have touch screens that allow you control and also tell you about how much energy and hot water you're using. Um, we also have just screens throughout the house. Um, and this is an example of what one of those would look like. We also have a wall wash so that one of your, one of your walls is actually going to change colors slightly based off of um, the, the levels in the house. And our last is convenience. Um, we, we still want to have all those convenient controls. You can still control your windows manually, your shades manually, and we have a customizable entry so that when you end, put your key into the house, it loads all of your settings uh, based off of what you like. So you're not going to have to go and customize this every time somebody different enters the house. We also have whole home audio just because that's really cool, and who doesn't want that? <laughs> and you can stream wirelessly to that and everything, too. So that's, that's a pretty fun one. So that is, that is Chameleon for you. All right. Thanks, Brian. And uh, next is uh, Will Lowe's from UMSL. And so far, most of us probably, and at least I have been able to follow pretty much what each of these projects are. I'm not sure that what Will may challenge me a little bit because he's going to talk about synthesizing nanostructures and how that can have an effect on a variety of different energy applications. Well, so, uh, I'm trying to give you an idea. Tell us what that's all about. All right. Oh. Yeah, move the mic just a little closer, Will. That'd be great. All right. My name is Will Ovis, and I'm from University of Missouri, St. Louis, and I'm working at the Center for Nanoscience. Uh, my advisor is Dr. Jimmy Liu, and He's given me a great opportunity to work with him. So, oh, let's see. Go down to the Mac versions, down the lower left hand corner, the third little button. Oops, oh. sorry. <laughs> there's, that's my desktop. Just click on the side and it'll come back up again. Click on where? Click over on the left hand side. Right over here. Sorry, it's my, my desktop's arranged strangely. Just click there. Now, in the lower right left hand corner, that yeah. third button right there. Yep, okay. you got it. Yeah, you can tell I'm not used to Macs. Okay. So I'm going to talk about metal oxide nanostructures for energy application. So first of all, you hear this term nano all the time, and I don't think a lot of people even know what it means. So nano is just a prefix. It means a billionth. So a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So to give you an idea of about how big that is, uh, human hair is 100,000 nanometers thick. So on that size scale, a hair is huge. And, a hydrogen atom is a tenth of a nanometer in diameter. So, and a hydrogen is the smallest molecule there is. So when we're talking about atoms and molecules, the nanometer scale is the most natural one to talk about. And so the world behaves differently down there. You get quantum mechanics comes into effect. And it's like if you were a little person living in a, let's say we were on the nano scale in this room, you might be stuck to the ceiling because Everything's so small, the mass, the mass is so small that gravity doesn't have nearly the effect that it does here, and static electricity comes in big. So there's a lot of differences when you're talking about that size scale. <clears throat> so our group is combined. Um, we have people from chemistry, backgrounds in electrical engineering, um, even a little biology and physics. So it's an interdisciplinary group. And that's kind of what our center is going for because we're trying to get the communities to interact and work together and share the knowledge with each other because traditionally everybody's been kind of separated. So we utilize a lot of different um, techniques, both um, chemical and physical, to synthesize metal oxide nanostructures for energy applications. So what's a metal oxide nanostructure? Just when uh, oxygen combines with metal, they interact and it'll, it'll form some kind of a structure. I mean, my advisor would probably kill me if you heard it, but it's basically it's like glorified rust, I guess. <laughs> you can, iron oxide is metal oxide. So, and when you're talking about synthesizing nanostructures, uh, it's so small, trying to manipulate things on that scale is very hard. It'd be kind of like trying to put together Legos wearing oven mitts, uh, maybe is a good way to describe it. So our synthesis methods uh, 
involve what we call the bottom-up approach, which is basically molecular self-assembly. And that means that the molecules just assemble themselves in a way which minimizes the energy of the system. They like to be in their most lazy state, basically, you could say that. And it's nice because we're making so many of these structures, we don't want to go there and put one atom here and one on top and one on top of that, that would take forever. So it's the best approach to work with. And so currently we're working with zinc oxide, copper oxide, and titanium dioxide. Um, and we're making nanowires and nano belts mainly. Uh, let's see. And this is one of our uh, experimental setups for synthesizing zinc oxide nanostructures. So basically what we have is a tube furnace and you have gas flowing through it and in the middle of the furnace you have a high temp the highest temperature and that's where we have our source material. We'll put like zinc oxide powder mixed with uh, carbon and it'll evaporate and the gas carries it down into the lower temperature zones where we have substrates that we've like put basically you could say seeds, catalyst particles and sometimes we don't even need the catalyst particles and the molecules they're in the vapor form and when they get to the lower temperature zone they condense onto those substrates and grow nanostructures. So then we just take them out and look at them. So that's the next thing. So you have this stuff, it's a nanostructure, it's so small you can't see it with your eye, so how do you know what you have? It turns out you can't even look at it with a light microscope because the wavelength of light is uh, too big to resolve those features. So we have to use electron microscopy. So our lab has uh, I guess four electron microscopes. And we also use x-ray diffraction to characterize the crystal structure. So these are some images of uh, copper oxide nanowires. And generally these, these uh, nanowires are about anywhere from 50 to 150 nanometers in diameter. And this was taken using a scanning electron microscope. Now that's not the actual color of the nanowires there. It's actually black, but I just thought it looked nicer this way. <laughs> it, that's kind of the fun thing with electron microscopy is you get, you get some neat images and you can, they're always black and white, so you get to color them however you want. <laughs> so, now I'm gonna talk about some uh, devices that in the future these materials could be used in. So, okay, I forgot to mention, one of the other things about the nanoscale is you have what's called a really high aspect ratio. These structures have a high surface area to volume ratio. So there's, which is, you'll see in a minute why that's so good. Um, right here you can, this is what we call a dye-sensitized solar cell. And basically what it is is you have a, uh, nanostructures that are coated with a sensitive dye. And when light hits that dye, it emits electrons, and then the electrons can travel down through the nanostructures, which are semiconducting, to the cathode and create electricity. So the idea is, like right here, this, this one shows uh, TiO2 particles. So if you have an electron in there and it's trying to find its way to bottom of the device. It can kind of hop around on those particles any which way and uh, it might take it longer to get there. And the idea is that if you had nanowires going just from top to bottom and even nanotubes that the charge could get from where it's generated down to the bottom much faster. And the other thing about nanotubes is their um, surface area the volume ratio is so good that the efficiency for collecting light is much better. And that's one of the areas of solar power that people are really working on is the efficiency because uh, if you can increase that, you can get so much more use out of the sun. And let's see. Here's another device. This is amazing to me. This is a nanogenerator. Um, 
these are already being um, explored and they're working on making them. Basically, what it is is uh, you have zinc oxide nanowires that are uh, between two plates. And the top plate has these tips that rub along the nanowires. And zinc oxide nanowires have this feature that when you bend them, they become charged because one side gets compressed and the other side is um, strained. And so you get charge difference between the two sides and that creates a voltage on those wires. So when you rub that uh, top along the wires, you get electricity. And you, since there's so many of the, you can put so many of these wires on a device, you can generate a good amount of electricity. And so you could think of if you had a material like this on the bottom of your shoes, you could be walking around all day and charging your cell phone with this device. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we're not quite there yet for that, but it's something you can think about. How am I on time? About a minute or two. Okay. And then, yeah, that's perfect. <coughs> so, the last thing I want to talk about is um, hydrogen production with titanium dioxide. So titanium dioxide is what's known as a photocatalyst. And a catalyst is just something that helps aid a chemical reaction. So it lowers the energy needed for that reaction to happen. And TiO2 can be used to split water, which is um, H2O, so hydrogen and oxygen. And we're interested in that because we want uh, hydrogen for fuel. So this is another area where the, that high surface area comes in. So if you put this catalyst in water and you have, you want the water, and when sun hits the water, uh, hydrogen will come out. And so the more surface area you have on your catalyst, the more likely it is for a light to hit it. So, and ideally you would want maybe to have a car that has water in the car and the sunlight can be able to hit it. And then you would have the hydrogen being produced in the car where you could use it. So, and we're still far off on that, but it's something to work towards. So a lot of the research we're doing is uh, basic and the applications will come later, but hopefully if people are interested and we get funding, <laughs> then more of that will come. Well, uh, I mean, Sarah, maybe you and your team won't be able to use nanostructures for your car, but maybe down the road some of your uh, your colleagues will be able to. But uh, Sarah is the president of the current Mizzou hydrogen car team, and uh, and needless to say, they're working on a hydrogen car. I remember years ago that Mizzou always had a solar car, but now we have a hydrogen car. So yeah. tell us a little bit more I really about what you're doing. I really couldn't have asked for a better segue, actually. Yeah. Um, let me get this. Oh, don't play yet. You're going to ruin the surprise. Um, <laughs> my name's Sarah. I'm actually a student in the School of Journalism here at Mizzou. Um, it's kind of a fluke that I ended up on the car team, but the team's always prided itself on being very interdisciplinary. Um, we pretty much incorporate every type of engineer. Um, it's a little harder for civils and some bio engineers to find some work to do, but <coughs> there's always stuff that they look into. And we also pick from the journalism school and the business school quite a bit because we're mostly a self-funded team. Um, this here is actually our car. If you go out on the south side of Jesse, we're right to the left if you're coming out of the building. And if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend you go check it out. Um, occasionally, if the weather stays nice, we'll be driving it around in circles. And it's, it's really interesting to see and actually here too. Um, I'm a senior, so I'll be graduating in December. Um, like it said, we were formerly the Mizzou Solar Project. Um, we built six different race cars, all Sun Tigers. A couple of them are still floating around here. Others have been scrapped for parts for later cars. Um, we used to do the North American Solar Challenge, which was a giant cross-country race, generally from around Texas to somewhere up in Canada. One year they did Route 66 from Chicago to California. Um, a lot of the same principles have carried over into our new team, thankfully and we were able to um, make the switch to hydrogen a lot more efficient in 2005. We had a couple different reasons for it, and it's not really that crucial to the team right now, but we were concerned we were gonna lose our race 
and frankly, without making a much larger budget, we wouldn't have been able to make a better car. So we decided to switch to hydrogen and it's probably one of the best changes we've made in the team in recent history. Um, the car process is essentially the same with any other prototype project. We have conception design, all of this fun stuff. Um, I have a lot of pictures and they're all really fun. The first thing we have to do after designing is to actually build the plug. Um, this here is the board that we end up using to make it. These aren't quite as cool. It's just us making the plug for the mold. Um, there's a lot of sanding, a lot of dust. We worked with a bunch of different companies throughout mid-Missouri to help us make this project. And there's, um, that's actually me learning how to use a power buffer. Um, being a journalism student, they made sure I got my hands in on every different project. And then we we're just here pro like protecting it and finding everything. Um, the mold we actually made was fiberglass. It's not a fun material to work with if you haven't used it. It's quite itchy. But um, this is just some of the background stuff we had to do. This is more of the fun part. This is us actually building the body. We made it in-house in our lab, right in Engineering Building West, down in the basement. Um, we had the opportunity to use uh, composites a lot, carbon fiber and Nomex in particular, things we really don't get um, exposed to in classes. And that's one of the nice things about this project. We learned design skills like in AutoCAD and ProE we use a lot, even before we touch them in a classroom. And when I say we, I generally refer to the engineers. I'm kind of the minority at the moment. Um, but this is just some composite work. And we, most of the information here we've had from solar cars, but once we get into more of the fuel cells, that's stuff we had to do research on our own. Right now we're in the middle of efficiency testing on our two fuel cells to see how well we can incorporate them into our next car. And then this is the, we're making the fairings on our actual car here. And then this is what it looked like before we had it painted. You can see the carbon fiber has a, a real nice weave texture to it. Um, it's a little dirty from sanding, but it's in a lab, so. This is actually the paint when it was done. It was nice and not quite scratched up yet. Um, this is just some of the other random points we made. Um, students on the team welded the frame themselves, all the electrical components, um, working with the fuel cells, um, creating a very safe refueling system. As you might have heard, hydrogen can be a little explosive when handled improperly. We wanted to make sure that before we even got on a road anywhere, we were not going to be a hazard to ourselves and others. And this is actually our little refueling station. We just have a little hose that hooks up in our trailer to the tank. And then this is us driving it around the parking lot at night. This is just driving the frame. Um, that's me working on the body some. And this was fun. Um, the, the frame itself weighs about 500 pounds. So we can't really lift that ourselves. Um, we had a cherry picker kind of lift it up and place it in. The car itself weighs about 600 pounds without a driver. It's quite heavy, but a lot of that's due to different components of fuel cells. Each weigh about 40 pounds each. Um, our tank weighs about 80 pounds, which I don't know if we have a very good picture of it. It's quite large, it's maybe like this long and then this wide. Um, and this is us just putting it together. And one of the really great experiences I've had in possibly my entire college experience is being able to go on the race with this car. We took the car down to Plano, Texas for the start of the 2010 North American Solar Challenge. Um, we were running as a demonstration vehicle. I mean, obviously we're not a solar car, so we have a little bit of an unfair advantage. Mainly we can drive at night and inhale. Um, we met a lot of really great teams there. Um, in this picture is Red River, it's a Canadian team out west. Uh, we were kind of the, the cool kids on the block because we had the only different car. And this is just us working on it. Um, this was actually outside of a hotel room in Fort Worth working on some various technical difficulties we had. And this is our campground. We were essentially camping. Um, this was the first experience I've had with fire ants. Not the most fun, I will, will tell you that. Um, as you can see, this is us here with uh, University of Waterloo next to us. Um, we actually had to move our car so they could put their solar panel out in the sun, and there was a lot of mocking with that one, a lot of teasing. And that's just our team. 
I'm actually sitting in the car barefoot. It's not comfortable to drive. Um, with Texas, we had one huge storm. We were there for like two weeks, and we had like the worst storm ever. It came on in like five minutes, and it lasted a half hour. And this was right before it was starting. Um, okay, they kind of skipped order here. Um, this was at a display day. The team has an opportunity to do a lot of different events and show our car there. This one, for example, um, this was just a display day where we had our, our board out and some team members talking about the car and the team. And this is just us working some more on it. Um, this was part of that freak rainstorm, and this was not a good experience because it showed why I was a journalist and not an engineer. There were nine people on this trip, and it started raining just randomly. Eight people ran with tarps to cover the car because you can't get the fuel cells all that wet because it'll corrode it. They're running to get tarps, and I'm running to get my camera. <laughs> so that was another week and a half of people going, why did we bring you? You're not the most useful. But we have really great pictures from it, so I think it was well worth it. <laughs> um, but if you didn't get to see us earlier, let me find it. Okay, so uh, one of the jokes is that we spent three years building this car. We did a year of research just on hydrogen. We're not going to make a car and not know what we're dealing with. Um, then we did a year of design, we did a year of build. Uh, we had to drop out of our race early due to technical difficulties. Um, and mainly it was the, the weighing the pros and cons of it. We had a car that could drive, but it maybe wasn't necessarily the safest to drive on a freeway, which was most of the race. So we've been um, kind of bragging and taking the car out and driving around. This is, if you can tell, there's Ellis right there. Um, this is 9th Street. We actually did this this morning. And then you can kind of see our car right there. And it's coming around. And this is just us driving. And that's the biker, our driver, almost hit. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's just it going. It's probably going about 20 miles an hour there. Um, we can actually drive quicker than that. It's just we technically weren't supposed to be driving there due to closed campus. And the cops told us to be safe about it. So. We weren't going to push it too much. Um, that's all I have, so. All right. Well, obviously, you can see that uh, we've got some really bright students on all four campuses working almost always. I think all, all of you talked about uh, some, some interdisciplinary approach or the need for that to make your projects work. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play Oprah. I'm going to go out and let other, everybody else ask questions. But while I'm doing that, I'll just seed that one question. Maybe you all can just talk a little bit about how important it is that you work across different disciplines to make your projects effective. And I don't care, really care who starts, just uh, jump in there and then I'll go out and get some uh, questions from the audience. Okay, well I can start. I think I have the most noticeable difference here. I'm not an engineer, but with any project you need people who are able to communicate a message. Um, and that's where my journalism school kind of comes into play. I always feel like I should pitch the journalism school when I talk. Um, but we have, a, we have a very elaborate system. I mean, you go on display with a car like what we have, you're going to have people that will ask you very specific questions about a fuel cell. What is the power outage? What is the coefficient of drag on the tires? And while an engineer will know that, a little third grader won't, or someone who maybe studied liberal arts in college or maybe didn't even go to college. So you have to be able to tell the same kind of story, explain a fuel cell to someone with a PhD and to someone who doesn't have that skill set. And that can be sometimes a challenge for engineers who think in a very specific sort of mindset. What other ways does the interdisciplinary approach is important to you all? If I steal that one next. Um, <laughs> we, we, you know, when you're building a house, that's not a small project at all, especially when you're doing everything from design and you have custom systems as well. Um, I can speak on our campus. We have everything from you know, myself, computer engineer, obviously some symbols. Um, what you might not expect is one of our construction, one of the guys that's doing a lot of our construction and helping head up that pro that team. Um, you know, history major. Uh, you wouldn't see that one coming. And we have a lot of different ones. On top of that, we get a lot of work with contractors as well, um, and I love them to death. But work working with the architects and interior designers is always interesting too. Our our focus is 100% engineering. I mean, you know, where's the... Anna, why don't you come down and join everybody and uh, answer some of the questions? Slide over. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. We, you know, there have been times where we want to put something somewhere just because it makes the most sense for a wire run. 
um, and it would look terrible. And there, you know, I remember one instance where we moved the kitchen um, just entirely and had to do a lot of rework on that too. So it's been a learning experience for everybody. I'm working with different companies, just very, very different disciplines and backgrounds as well. I guess some of the things that go along with that too uh, are um, <laughs> just, just no, just to follow up is just that um, in in the classroom we really don't get these experiences and learning a lot about you know engineering and architecture together is is really huge. Um, we really have learned a lot from them as well, just like why different things go different places and things like that. And I'd like to think that we pay a little bit more attention to how things look now. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Once the, once the house gets built, I guess we'll know a lot better. But. I have a couple points to yeah. feel like. Uh, well, I, I think one way that this is illustrated is with your story about the rainstorm and the, the hydrogen car. Uh, because I, I think it's great that we had eight people, that you had eight people running to get a tarp. But I think it's great that you had a journalist there, too, because we wouldn't have the picture otherwise to tell the story about it. So I think that's a, a really good example of the interdisciplinary aspect um, and in my own experience. I know a lot about sustainability, energy conservation. I have no idea how dashboard works. It's magic to me. Um, <laughs> something happens and the like, electricity goes around and there's some monitor somewhere attached to a wall. I don't know. Uh, there was a, a really good uh, illustration. Uh, I was talking to the energy management people um, and the residential life IT people and Lucid Design Group, the company in California that's, uh, that runs this whole system. And they were, they were using all this jargon. I had no idea what they were talking about, um, trying to coordinate these three people uh, getting this done. And it, it got to the point where I called up uh, Lucid Design Group and just said, here's the deal. We're going to do a three-way call. Uh, you're going to talk to the engineer, and I'm just going to sit there. Um, I think I said two words in the whole conversation. They went back and forth for about three minutes, uh, figured out what the problem was, and fixed it that quick. And I just said, OK, thanks, and got off the phone. Uh, again, the, the interdisciplinary aspect. Um, they knew way more than me about those, those uh, parts of the project. I can bring people together. Uh, I can get funding for it. I can't make it work. I have to get other people to do that. Um, and again, you know, outside the classroom, the experience is there. Uh, with my future career, I hope to be a sustainability advocate um, hope to work with large institutions and help them become greener, uh, more environmentally sustainable while addressing their mission, making money, uh, whatever the intention is there. Uh, so project management is going to be big in implementing these things and bringing people together. And this is something that I can't do in a classroom, um, especially as a biology major. You don't get a lot of that, as you can imagine. So having this opportunity, again, uh, through the IIF is really important. My name is Jen Huding. I'm in the journalism school, and actually, I'm um, participating in a fellowship at University of North Carolina this summer. We're focusing entirely on energy and the environment and demographics. My question was for Ben, I believe, um, with Mizzou Dashboard. And actually, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this question. You kind of just touched on it, but um, I was kind of curious um, what types of steps were involved with this process of setting it up in the different um, resident halls. And I guess you just answered one of my questions about um, Lucid Design Group. I did not know if they provided the system that and the interface that we saw online or how much of that was um, hands-on work by Mizzou students. Or Yeah. Um, Lucid Design Group has the software. So we essentially just bought it uh, and bought data loggers to install in the residence halls. Um, it wasn't a lot of work by Mizzou students because a lot of uh, the work that had to go on was in the electrical rooms of the residence halls and kind of dangerous places um, and dealing with systems that uh, they didn't want the risk of students uh, handling. So a lot of it was behind the scenes, a lot of uh, drilling through concrete walls and running wires and cables, uh, attaching the data logger. Uh, hopefully from here on out there will be a lot more student involvement, um, especially with the marketing components and the competition. Uh, I didn't build that up nearly as much as I should have this year. That's one of the things I, I learned is that I need a crew of students to help me out too, um, just to get the word out in the halls and, and to run events and uh, make it much more interactive uh, with the students. So hopefully in the future we'll be able to do that, uh, like I said, next semester and in the coming semesters with the system. Does that answer your question at all? Okay. Sure. Hello. Oh, I'll hold it over here. Uh, Barbara Buffalo in the Department of Architectural Studies. And I have a question for you guys. Most of you are doing projects that require funding. 
And as we talked about in the Energy Summit yesterday, they said that most of our energy use is in buildings. And so I'm wondering, but we hear more about our energy use in, in the press and in the news and everything, is transportation. So I was wondering between kind of the two, two different types, like with buildings and then also car, and then just research on energy stuff. Do you guys find that um, for funding of your projects or interest of outside people, your advisory board, that someone has more interest, that you're feeling more interest? Or who gets more money? What do I say? To get more money? Well, um, I think people are showing a little more interest. It's, I think it's not at the point where it needs to be yet because I mean, the problem is that a lot of the basic research isn't going to have an immediate payoff. So companies aren't going to want to sink money into that. So government funding for that is good. But I guess at our center, we have seen there's a guy in hydrogen production or hydrogen storage that has recently gotten some big grants. So it's starting to change a little bit, which is good. And I don't know how much about the the corporation aspect really applies to us. I mean, in the, we have a lot of really generous corporate sponsors. I mean, if you look at any picture of the car, most of their names are on there. Um, but I think part of the thing that helps us is that you cannot turn on a TV of some sort and not hear about the auto industry. So we already have a really strong backing. People always want answers to why is it taking $100 to fill up a truck. And so we already have a lot of um, leverage with different companies that are interested in that. Um, but we also do um, a lot more targeted um, talking or targeted marketing. We speak with sponsors that are specifically related to either um, auto industry, the hydrogen production industry, or engineering firms. A lot of our sponsors come from those three main areas. Um, but our team, uh, we're fully funded by students, and I, I can agree, marketing and doing all that on your own, on a huge team, totally difficult. I do that all on my own, too, so I totally sympathize with you on that. Um, but I think, at least with cars, it's a lot easier because it's hard. I mean, houses are kind of there, and you don't think about it as much. Cars are always an active thought. Um, I'm going to kind of approach that one from a little different angle, and I think one of the things that we've found, and we have kind of an interesting situation at Missouri S&T because we have a lot of different design teams and a lot of them are focused on energy and we work pretty closely with some of them and share resources. Um, one of the things that we've found is that, um, that there is this huge push for energy um, and you can't turn on a TV without hearing about just energy in general either. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's a lot of different things going on with it, so there's a lot of things the public doesn't know about. So, um, I, I, like the car competition as well, there's a lot of good stuff and big competitions going on. So we, we found that there's a lot of companies that are receptive to just, you know, how can they get word about the technology about? Not necessarily themselves. There's a lot of companies that actually just care about getting word about this stuff out. Um, our competition, you know, we, we pump 100, there's 120,000 people there. So we, we get to showcase a lot of different technologies. That's why we're, we're using a lot of different things. And, and they don't always work. We don't always do them right. But um, at least trying, companies are interested in that. Um, and, and it's the same thing with the car competitions and everything else as well, and the research that's going to fuel it. So um, that there's a lot of companies that are working and, and corporate sponsors that are realizing that these all need to go together. Um, and we found that, too. We have a lot of different companies that give to all of our different teams because we do work together in that way. I'd be curious to hear from all of you, uh, or as many of you as want to answer it anyway. Our last session, we were talking about how well journalists cover the energy debate in the energy sector and I and not just from Sarah who's engaged in journalism but the rest of you talk a little bit about your own impressions about how well the media however you want to def define that local national whatever covers the critical energy issues and what kind of advice if any do you have for uh, doing a better job if a better job needs to be done I think a lot of times uh, what you see in the media, you, you get some really overly optimistic um, coverage. And I think if they could focus more on some of the real challenges that our people are facing in terms of getting the energy cheaper, that maybe it would give people more of an idea of how hard it's going to be. Because a lot of times you do see 
things that you're like, oh, well, they're just they're being way too optimistic about this. So. Yeah. yeah, I kind of disagree about that. And maybe it's just because most of the media that I deal with, um, at least in respect with the car, has to do with the auto industry. Um, one thing that I don't think, at least national media-wise, they do not pick up on as much as there are a lot of research projects that go into companies like Ford and GM and Honda, Toyota, um, all of those major companies. Fiat is another one with a huge research. Um, Peugeot, which is a French company, huge research that goes into development and stuff. And all of these cars have prototypes and models of vehicles that run off of alternative energies. I mean, you look at the Chevy Volt, that's a wonderful example of it. Um, the FCX Clarity is another kind of good one. That one's leasing in California right now, but it's a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. It's a sedan. Um, but a lot of the times we, at least in the auto industry, get overlooked because it's all about the money and the finances. And I mean, I understand that you need the money and the finances to do the research, but I think they're a lot more pessimistic in terms of the auto industry. But um, locally, at least with our team, we've had a lot of really positive coverage. Um, a lot of the schools, Kate, or a lot of the school outlets, um, the Missourian case, or not case, I'm sorry, KOMU, they've all done multiple stories on us. We get graduate students that come in working on projects and stuff, and um, those basic news writing classes, we get a lot of really positive support from them. We really appreciate it. Do you have thoughts on the media or critiquing how many coverage covers energy? Were you saying optimistic in the way that they're like, oh, well, this will be the solution for all? Like, yeah, 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 like the whole greenwashing, like, oh, mm -hmm. we'll just jump on this bandwagon and this one's going to, we're, we're, we're cool. Solar's yeah. going to save us all, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and they don't a lot of times say what their, some of the real challenges are behind the actual design, manufacturing, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's really hard to cover uh, sustainability issues in general because they're so complicated. And you have to look at the problem, but then also upstream and downstream um, influences and effects and consequences. So I, I empathize with journalists uh, a lot because it is really complicated to, to deal with these issues. Um, they're really big, uh, really tangled. Uh, so you have to you have to take the issues and somehow you know untie all the knots and look at everything and then distill it down so that you can convey it in a 30-second spot or you know a 1,000-word uh, story somehow. And it's it's really hard to do. Um, so I think that's an aspect that we have to consider too is just the the complexity involved here. We're looking at natural systems that are global um, often. Or you know infrastructure that everyone uses um, across the board uh, somehow. So I think that, that looking at, at that um, and taking that into account also is, is important. One last question. Okay, hi, I'm Bill Allen. I teach science journalism here, and I wanted to ask a, a question about uh, your your fellow students. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your perception of the interest in these energy. Um, solutions uh, among your fellow students, um, for example, in the uh, uh, the system in the in the residence halls, how many people participate? Um, are you all viewed as kind of the the geeks on campus, or are people really truly interested in what you're trying to do? Well, I think people get a little more interested when gas goes up to like four dollars a gallon. So, yeah. uh, but no, I I would say. Perceptions kind of changing in general uh, for science. That it's not all just geeky. It is something interesting and useful. So. Yeah, and I, I think there's kind of a geek sheet nowadays, too, where uh, <laughs> the geeks run the world, but also they're becoming cooler. Um, I've embraced my inner geek. I'm comfortable with this. Uh, I geek out all the time about everything. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of interest by students. Um, a lot of them didn't quite understand how the system worked, just like me, uh, but it's made to be very user-friendly. Mizzou Dashboard is supposed to be something that anyone can log on to from anywhere and use. Um, I'm not sure what the level of participation in the competition was. Um, I'm still kind of hearing some secondhand stories. Uh, I need to work with ResLife next year on this because they had a lot of strict regulations where I couldn't go into the halls and interact, which are important. Uh, we should have those rules in place to protect the, the residents and everything. Um, but I think there was a lot of interest 
uh, and energy conservation as a you know as a, a concept, um, and also since it's such a a huge issue and an emerging issue, um, I think it's it's become something significant there. I, I love science journalism, um, I should say, too, because I think that the other important aspect of this is just the basic knowledge. Uh, if we're dealing with all these complex issues and we have to know the, the basics that underlie them, um, you know, how energy functions, how mass functions, how they interact, uh, pollutants, things like that. So, about the rest of you? How, how do you think the rest of your colleagues or other students see the work you're doing? Well, oh. all you, go oh. ahead. <laughs> I was say, I think we get really lucky with the hydrogen car. It's a weird looking little thing. I mean, it's, it's really low to the ground and it makes this weird like whirling noise. And when you're the only car driving on a closed campus, a lot of people will just stop and kind of stare. And we've had a lot of people just um, randomly come up and like as we're like biking with the car, you know, generally nice to have someone with it. They'll be like, what is that? And it's like a hydrogen car. And they're like, what is that? And then they'll come by our like little display and ask so many questions and you can just see like this little light bulb going off in their head. So um, the, the geek thing, we're like 90% engineers, so that's totally, <laughs> totally relative for us. Um, so I guess I'm going to ignore that part of your question. Um, but we, we have houses and people are actually living in them. So one of our big things is community outreach. Um, I, I live in one of them, I can tell you, I've, probably, I've toured hundreds of people um, every year. And you get, you get a wide range. You get kids that don't really care about the solar part, but they like the houses. You get, you get people that care about the energy, and that's what most of them are. There's a lot of people that are interested and haven't been able to see it. Um, so, so by being able to show everybody what you're actually doing, um, we, we get a lot of students to, we, we build our new house in the middle of campus. So we, we get a lot of new recruitment just because people don't know what it is and, and they're interested. And it's, it's, it's a really interesting to, to see how people are really drawn to it. And we have people come from, we'll have people, we've had people come all the way from different countries to see our houses as well. So. Um, it, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, people don't always realize we live in them too, so I'll come home once in a while or run, run outside to do an errand and someone's sitting in my house when I get back. But I, I take it to mean they're interested, so I guess that's a good thing at least. So, <laughs> Any last thoughts from our student panels? We're wrapping up. I think it, just the whole um, trend of going green now has made it a lot easier for all of us who really care about it um, to be more vocal and to not be viewed as geeky or anything. So when we tell people we're working on a solar house, the first word is usually cool instead of, um, you know, a weird look or something because of all the media that has been channeled at um, green efforts. So that's really nice that kind of the whole community and the whole um, I think society is nearing like a tipping point of this green movement and maybe well, hopefully soon in the future we won't really even need to be talking about green because everything is. <laughs> That's probably a good way to wrap it up. I, I don't know about the rest of you but I think that's very encouraging to see on all four of our campuses just the level of expertise and interest we have in these energy issues. So why don't we uh, all say thanks to uh, Anna and Ben and Jared and Paul and Brian and Will and Sarah. Thank you very much.